Hi, I'm Gary Katz. I want to thank all the folks who bought copies of my DVD programs over the last 20 years. If it wasn't for their support and the support of companies like Windsor One and Stabila, I never would have been able to produce what turned out to be a 10 program series on mastering finished carpentry. Those 12 to 20 year old videos look pretty terrible compared to streaming video today. And that's why I'm no longer selling the DVDs, but the carpentry techniques haven't aged much at all. And that's why I'm making them available here for free. Enjoy. Since we've been working with walls and ceilings, let's get into installing crown on a cathedral ceiling. I didn't have room in this studio or in my budget for a full size cathedral ceiling like the one in this photograph. Besides, I'm tired of talking to you from on top of that ladder. This is the set I use at the JLC Live shows and at Lumberyard shows too. I've included this short section of flat ceiling here intentionally. And let's start there with the standard crown installation. This first piece that goes on this wall here has, an, has a self return on the left side and an inside corner on the right. And we're going to cut a butt cut for that so that we can cope into it with the next piece. And I've already cut that piece and pre-assembled it so we can move along quicker. Here's the piece. It has a self-return cap on the right side and it has a butt cut on the left side. And I've even mortised the bottom of this, you know, to accept the next coat piece so we don't have to do it in place. So I can take this piece and put it up here and tack it in place. I could measure this next piece and probably pre-assemble this whole thing, but sometimes marking moldings in place is a surefire way to avoid making a big mistake. And when you're working on a funny ceiling like this one, try and take every precaution you can. Believe me, you'll make plenty of mistakes anyway. Here's a short piece I've already coped. I cut the cope joint, cope joint on the left end of this, and I'll fit this piece up into the corner and probably give it a good smack with my hammer just to tighten this all up. There we go. And now I can mark the measurement right in this corner. Hey, you notice what's happening here? Remember I said at the beginning of the program that you always measure and mark crown molding on the bottom of the molding, not at the top. Right, except for self-returns like we had at that soffit there. Self-returns were the first exception to that rule. Well, here's the second exception, a slope ceiling. First, notice that this is an outside corner here. It's not an inside corner. The short point of the miter and bevel will be right here, and the long point's going to be out here. So it's an outside corner. We always measure outside corners to the short point. So I'll make my mark right here. Actually, this is a really cool thing, that measurement marks are made on the top of the molding for slope ceilings, rather than the bottom down here, where they're made for flat ceilings. It's really cool because Whenever you install crown on a cathedral ceiling or up any rake like a barge rafter, you always cut the molding in your saw right side up. You don't turn it upside down. Keep it right side up at your saw. Joe Fusco taught me that a few years ago. In fact, it took him a few years to teach me. I'm really kind of dense. Remember, as soon as you make a turn from horizontal to raked, you're changing the plane of the molding. Now let's go cut this piece. Yeah, I think we'll cut these pieces one at a time. There's just too much room here for air, not because it's difficult, but because each corner is unusual. Oh, <laughs> speaking of unusual, how about this angle here? That's not a 45 outside corner, is it? Let's see what angle that corner is. It's 150 degrees. Cool. The miter for 150 degrees is 75, right? I mean, 150 divided by 2 equals 75. Now we can cut this piece. Wait a minute. You know what? 
I think I'll put my right hand on this end because that's the end we want to cut a 75 degree outside corner miter on, right? The right hand end. I've still got my right hand on the right end of this thing so I won't get confused. Now all I have to do is put this piece in my saw right side up. Like I said before, because this piece goes up the gable end. When I turn this profile right side up and it sits in my saw like this, it's lower than the original pencil line on my fence. That's because this profile has a 38 degree spring angle. If the spring angle was 45 degrees, the molding would be at the same pencil line right side up or upside down. Okay, that was a right hand outside corner, so I want the short point against my fence. Now, all I have to do is swing my saw in this direction, which I've already done, and set it at 75 degrees. Oh, whoops. It only goes up to 60. Now what do I do? Let's back up just a few feet and take a better look at what's really happening here. There's a really valuable lesson to be learned from that corner angle. Take a look at this little set I built. probably call a wall angle like this a 22 and a half, right? Some of you might even call it a 45. That's because the miter is a 22 and a half and both miters make it a 45, right? Wrong. Not true at all. This is a 135 degree corner. The reason you think it's a 22 and a half or a 45 is because the numbers on your miter saw gauge are all wrong and those numbers have confused you and other carpenters for years. I know they sure confused me. Lots of carpenters, myself included, have a tough time understanding angles and these numbers make it nearly impossible. Here's why. Protractor paralysis. You know what I mean? Angle fatigue. The way you feel when you can't use a protractor and you have to cut two blocks of wood over and over until you get the right miter. The whole problem is caused by these numbers on our miter saws. Here's a company that's come up with a solution that just riles me. If you're willing to spend 50 bucks on a Sterrett protractor like this one, you'll be able to use a miter saw a lot easier. But this protractor doesn't solve the real problem because it's made especially for reading the wrong angle. And that just perpetuates the problem. Watch what I mean. I'll place this protractor in the corner here and look at what it reads. This protractor says that the miter for this corner is 22 and a half, and it says the angle is 45. Here's the single cut angle, but that's totally wrong. This well-built tool stretches the misperception that this is a 22 and a half miter in a 45 degree corner, an acute angle when it's really an obtuse angle. Listen, a 90 degree corner looks just like this, and a 45 looks like this and a 22 and a half angle is even sharper, like this. A 22 and a half is so acute that we rarely work with one unless we're casing a trapezoid or a triangular window, or cutting a scotia miter between the baseboard and the skirt board, or installing crown in an octagon coffered ceiling, or installing baseboard on a wall that's as sharp as a knife. I like this protractor a lot. The gauge is easy to read, it's a durable tool. I just wish it had normal protractor angles on it. Let's not spend any more time or money confusing a simple issue. Just go over to your miter saw right now, take a sharpie, red or black, doesn't matter, or a marks a lot, and right where it says zero, write down 90. And right where it says 10, write down 80. And right where it says 20, write down 70, just like I've done on my saw here. Those are the real numbers for all the angles you'll be cutting. If you write down the real numbers and start using them to describe corners rather than the wrong ones that come on your saw, you'll understand angles a lot better and you'll be able to use a simple, inexpensive protractor just like this one. Before long, when you look at a corner like this, you'll immediately think 135 degrees, 67 and a half miter, and you'll be on the right track to making miters the easy way. Now, where were we? Oh, we were gotta cut a 75 degree miter. We wanna cut a 75 degree miter on this outside corner for the ceiling rake. 
75 is really 15 on my miter gauge, so all I have to do is set my saw at 15 and line this up to make the cut. I've got the molding right side up with the measurement mark toward the blade, so this should work. There, that fits. Now let's ne measure this next piece, the one that goes up the ceiling here. This one's pretty simple. We know it has a 75 degree outside corner miter on the left end. And on the top, it has to miter into this inside corner at the peak of the roof. That corner up there has a 120 degree angle, which is a 60 degree miter. And I can measure that piece right along the ceiling. From the end of this piece here, right up to the peak of the roof. And that measures 21 and 3 eighths snug. I'll go cut that piece now. I'll cut the right hand in first, the way I always do. Now that's a 60 degree miter. So I set the saw at 30. And I swing the saw toward me. That's because this is an inside corner piece and I want the long point up against the fence. I've got the crown in here right side up. Oh, I've got it upside down. Now I've got it right side up. I've got the crown in here right side up at the lower line. So I'm ready to make this cut. I'll just clamp this here to hold the piece steady for a minute because I didn't put a fence in. But all I have to do now is hook my tape measure on the long point of this inside corner and measure across to the 75 degree outside corner on this end. And that piece was 21 and 3 eighths. Now the saw swung in the right direction already because one side of this piece has an inside corner and the other side has an outside corner. But I need to change the angle setting to 15. So I'll swing the saw to 15 and that should do it. There. Let's go see how it fits. I may have to trim a little bit off this piece. Oh, that fits just right. I'll just tack that in place. And now, let's get to the hard part, cutting the transition. Take a look at what crown molding's like on a sloped ceiling. This is a piece of the crown we're using. The flat fillet is much larger on the bottom than it is on the top, so I know which way the crown sits on the wall, just like so. And notice the angle that the crown is at in relationship to the wall. This is the spring angle of the crown. The angle that the crown springs from the wall toward the ceiling. As I slide this crown up the wall, and get it right up near the ceiling, you'll see that in order to get the front of the crown molding tight up against the ceiling here, I have to rip a new shoulder on the top of the crown, one that follows the slope of the ceiling, just like this. I'm just gonna trace a line that's fairly parallel to the ceiling here. Ripping this new shoulder requires some skill and a table saw fixture. Let me show you how to do it.
In order to make the new shoulder cut on this crown, I have to position the crown on this side of my saw blade. And I have to stand it up like this, too, in order to make this really sharp angled cut. This is an operation that's way too dangerous to do by hand. You just don't want to freehand this through the blade. Here's a fixture that I made that makes it a lot safer to rip a new shoulder on crown. And it makes it a lot more accurate, too. I made this fixture just by ripping one board, this one here, at a 45 on both edges. So it has a 45 degree bevel at the top and at the bottom. And I joined it to a straight piece right here, just a sub fence. I also attached a couple of stops, this one here and this one here. And the stops are literally just that. They stop the molding from sliding off the fixture as you're pushing it through the saw. There's an article included on these DVDs that explains in more detail how to make one of these. I added a strip of scrap wood right here just to stop the molding from rocking because this piece of crown has a big bull nose on it, and otherwise it would rock as it goes through the fixture. You may not need this extra strip depending on the profile of the crown molding you're cutting. And I built this fixture at 45 degrees. So it sits on the saw just like this, but that's not the angle that I'm going to rip this at. That's just a really good starting point. I'm going to move this up against the blade of the saw a little closer. Then I can take my crown molding with my scribe line, and I can pitch the angle of the bevel on the blade to follow that scribe line. So I'm just eyeballing this till I get it parallel to the line. And then once I cut this piece along that line, this piece will end up being parallel to the ceiling. Now I'm ready to cut, except I want to clamp this fixture in. So I'll put a clamp down here and another one up at this end. That's why the fixture is hollow. And now we'll take a pass. You can see the saw is cutting right to here, and I really want the saw to cut right to there. So I need to move the fixture in the fence a little bit closer to the blade, about an eighth of an inch. So I'll do that right now. Slide that up, and I'll take another pass. When a piece gets right close to the end like this, always use a push stick. Otherwise, your fingers are going to be getting way too close to the blade. And if it makes you nervous making a cut like this, because it can be a little spooky feeling, you can always shut the saw off like I just did, and pull the piece out, and just take it over to your saw and cut off the end of it. I mean, it's a lot better to lose six inches off the end of this piece of molding than it is to lose a few inches off your fingers. Really, there's never any reason to push yourself beyond what you feel is safe. When you hear that little voice warning you that something's dangerous, listen to it and stop what you're doing. Now we're ready to figure out the miter for this corner here. Most of us, when we approach a corner like this, we immediately think, oh, I need to read the angle right here. And with this Bosch protractor, you can read this angle within a tenth of a degree. You can get it right on. But don't be led astray. This angle is a red herring. First of all, visualize how this crown molding has to change planes as it comes across the ceiling here, turns this corner, then twists and goes up the rake. I mean, the crown can't twist from this angle to this angle by itself. Not in a single corner with a miter. Well, well wait, there is a way you can do it. You can miter this corner no problem, you'll get no argument from me. 
But in order to miter the corner, you have to change the spring angle on this piece of crown. Let me show you what I mean. Here's the piece of crown running horizontal across the wall. And there's the spring angle it should sit at, because this fillet is flat against the wall here. Here's the piece of crown molding coming down the ceiling. And here's the correct spring angle, because this fillet is flat against the wall here. And you notice, as these pieces come together, the long point on this miter here has nothing to terminate against down here. It's not matching up with this piece of crown. This piece of crown needs to come down the wall so that the long point on that miter will have something to meet. It has to meet up with this piece of crown in my right hand. So I have to take this piece and straighten it out on the wall to about there before this piece will be able to miter into this piece. The steeper the pitch, the more you have to angle this piece. On a 6 and 12 ceiling, just forget it. Besides, I think this approach is wrong, wrong, wrong. It's kind of like mitering stair railing on a rising run. I mean, it looks like, well, I think you know what I mean. I also think it's wrong to change the spring angle of crown molding. I mean, you can change it a little, but not a lot. Crown molding was designed to imitate the cornice on a classical column. And the spring angle of the crown is meant to position the face of the molding so that you see the profile in the most pleasing light, with the shoulder cuts plumb and the fillets level. Here's the shoulder cut. On the top should be plumb. This shoulder here should be plumb. And this fillet here should be level. If you change the spring angle of the crown, especially if you flatten the molding out on the wall, it's no longer crown molding, but chair rail. Chair rail is fine when it's 30 inches off the floor, but up against the ceiling, no way. Now, there is a way to miter this corner and maintain the correct spring angle, but you have to use two different sizes of crown with the same profile. The sizes will vary according to the pitch of the ceiling. Here's an example. Notice how the returns on the top and the bottom of this cornice are totally different sizes of molding from the rake run. The craftsman on this 18th century home made custom crown molding for each run. Of course, if you can do that on your job, go for it. But that's not possible on most jobs today. There are some crown molding profiles available in a variety of sizes, but not many. So if you're working with a custom crown molding like this Windsor 1 or something, here's another way to handle these corners. To make this plane change, I cut a transition piece just like a stair railing. Really, there's no difference between a rising volute or a gooseneck. Here's what I mean. A transition is nothing more than a single piece that's cut differently on each end, so that one end of the piece matches up with a run of molding going in this direction, pointing uphill, and the other end matches up with a run of molding going in this direction, running across the ceiling. I'm going to use a transition piece to turn this corner. I start by cutting a regular inside corner on the left-hand end of this piece. I've already cut that. And you've seen it. It fits right in here. This piece has a regular inside corner. If I took another piece of molding and fit it into that corner, it would, just, it would fit in there just perfectly, just like it would on a normal ceiling. Imagine this is a normal ceiling running across here. This is a transition. I have to come out of this corner with a piece like this one so that I can turn the corner, so that I can transition around the corner. I cut both of these pieces upside down at my saw because they go on a regular horizontal ceiling. You see what I mean? I'm pretending this is a normal flat ceiling. I'll just, I won't try not to repeat it too many more times. I've even drawn a pencil line across here just so everybody can see what I'm talking about. This is where a flat ceiling would run. So now I've got a normal inside corner cut on the left end of this piece and a normal inside corner cut on the right end of this piece. These two pieces form the right hand end of the transition. Now I have to cut the other side of the transition. That's the side that will match up with the molding that goes up the rake. It's actually easier to do than you might think. Remember, we said that crown molding going up a sloped ceiling is always cut right side up in your miter saw? 
Well, this side of the transition has to be cut right side up too. So it will match with the piece going up the rake here. And that's what I mean by a transition. And we already know what the angle of this cut is. It's the same angle we cut over here, because that's the angle of the pitch of the ceiling, unless the pitch of the ceiling's changed. We can check that. We've got a level run coming out of the ceiling right here, where this pencil line is, just like we had on the other side. Here's the level run over here. I can put a protractor on this line, but if I do, I've got to make a common sense judgment. I've got to recognize that I'm not working on this acute angle. This is a red herring, too. I'm working on an obtuse angle, a wide one, right? I mean, remember how wide this angle was over here? See how wide this angle is and see how acute this one is? I've got to use my common sense to remember that this angle here is going to be somewhere near 150 degrees, just like this one was. This corner here reads 30 degrees right now, if I get my protractor in here. Yep, it reads 30 degrees. That's a pretty acute angle. Immediately, I should think, I need the complement to that angle. As a carpenter, I should have the common sense to know that I very rarely work with acute angles. So that means I have to probably know what the complement to that angle is, because that's the angle I really need to work with. Just do the math in your head to figure out the complement. Subtract 30 degrees from 180 degrees, and you have the 150 degrees. It's, that's all the math is right here. It's not that confusing. And remember, this was 150 degrees, too. If all this math is confusing to you, here's another way to look at it. Mike Slogan calls this one of my Egyptian methods. You know, hieroglyphics? Use whatever works for you. It doesn't matter. I draw a line parallel to the ceiling right here. You can use a block of wood to come down parallel to the ceiling and intersect this line with this line coming out of the corner of the wall and then take your protractor and put it on this angle right here, just like so. Because really, that's the angle of the crown molding coming down the ceiling and turning the corner, not this angle here. And that's going to read 150 degrees right on. So now I can cut the other side of the transition at 75 degrees, or 15 on the miter saw gauge, just like I cut that other corner right here. You know, I didn't show you how I cut those inside corners, the normal ones, so I'll show you that again. Here's that piece that we just ripped, that new top shoulder on. I'll place that in my saw upside down. And we'll get this right. There's the bottom here, so it's upside down. And that means the right-hand ear is going to get a left-hand inside corner for that horizontal piece. So I'll cut that right now. This is in the wrong place. We don't need that. So I'll cut this right now at the upper line. And that's a normal inside corner. So I swing the saw to 45. Now that piece only needs to be about 10 inches long. So because it has a butt cut on the end, I'll just mark that off around 10 inches. need to cut the right hand end of the transition. That's the end that goes into that corner over there and I, that's a normal inside corner and it has to be cut off the left end of the molding because it's upside down. So I'll put the piece over here and that's a regular inside corner too. So the long point has to be against the fence. So I'll swing the saw all the way over to here and I'll cut that piece. Okay, now I'm ready to cut the other side of the transition. And that's what we've been building up to, right? Remember, the molding going up the rake has to be cut right side up. So all I have to do is turn the molding around like this and put it back in my saw right side up. And I'm putting it now at the lower line on my miter saw fence. 
I want this transition to be as small as possible. I don't want it to interfere with the rake crown meeting the horizontal crown. That means I have to cut the mitre right here, barely nipping the bevel on the opposite side. And this is a 15 degree outside corner, so I swing the saw and I'll make my cut. I'll creep the material up to the blade until I'm cutting exactly on the right spot. Fast acting glue is really good for this job. I'll put the glue on a small piece here. I'll spray the bigger piece. I'm going to have to hinge this closed. I'll hold my fingers here because it's going to set up pretty quick. There we go. Just like that. So here's that transition piece we just cut. Here's the back side of it and you can see, remember we had to cut it off a piece that had the new shoulder ripped on it. And it fits in here just like so. I'm going to put this in here and tack it so that the bottom here is level. I've got to have this in here, otherwise I can't measure for this next piece right here. Well, let's measure for that now, since that is in there. Measuring from here down to this point here is 16 and an eighth tight. I'll cut it 16 and a 16th. And this is just tacked in here because I'm going to want to pull it out later. You'll see why. So this piece measures 16 and a 16th from an inside corner up here. That's a 30 degree cut. It's a 60 degree miter, but it's 30 degrees on a miter saw. And that's on the left hand end of the piece to a 15 degree cut on the right hand end. That's a 75 degree miter. You know, I think I'm going to write those down on this cut list, or I'm sure to forget. That's a 30 degree cut on the left and a 15 on the right, and it was 16 and a 16th, right? Okay, let's go cut that now. Okay, I just cut the right hand 15 degree outside corner on this last piece. Now this is the piece that's going to go up the gable end. I've put a continuous fence back on here again with the molding right side up in my saw and that will prevent me from cutting the molding upside down for sure. Now I'm going to take this piece and I'll flush it up with the end of my extension fence here. And that piece measures 16 and a 16th. I'll make a mark at the back of the molding here. That's to the inside corner at the ridge. That's a 30 degree cut. Oh, and you know, for this mark here, I think I'm going to transfer that line to the back so I can see it better. So I'll make a little mark there. Good. And now I'll line that up and make that cut. For some cuts that are hard to see, I mark a line on the back of the molding. While holding the crown with my hand locked against the end of the fence, I let the saw stop and lean over the miter saw fence to check that the blade is cutting right to the line on the back of the material. That should do it, I hope. I'm going to have to pull this piece off in order to get this one in. Let me pull this nail out of here too before it gets me. Sometimes you have to pull, put these pieces in simultaneously, especially if you're working with little small pieces like this in a real tight area. So I'll squeeze these both in at the same time. And they're a bit snug, but I think I'd rather force it. You know, I could take this piece back and cut a little bit off of it if I do. There. 
If I did cut a little off of it, it'd be too short for sure. That's not too bad. Let me tack this in place. I'll put a tack up here too. I can take a hammer and a little block of wood and tap these around a little bit and wiggle these pieces in until the joints fit just perfectly. But you know what? I don't think too many of you are going to be installing crown on a cathedral ceiling anyway. In fact, that's not the real reason I decided to do this presentation. What I really wanted to show you were two other things. How important it is to stop visualizing miters and instead use the long point short point method so you'll always know which way to miter your moldings at your miter saw and how to cure a serious case of protractor paralysis. Start using your protractor. It'll become one of your best friends, honest. Installing crown on kitchen cabinets can be a nightmare or a dream. I've hung a couple of cabinets beneath this soffit here. It's pretty much the typical thing you'd find on a job site. And I've intentionally made this set a bit more typical than you might think. Let's check this out first. This crown molding, here's the bottom of the crown. Let's put it in this framing square here. And that'll tell us exactly how much the crown drops from the ceiling. If I hold it flat against the top of the square right up here and pretend that's the ceiling, then the bottom of the crown is against the wall or the cabinets and you can see it's right at three inches. So this crown drops from the ceiling three inches. But when I measure this cabinet, it drops just over two and three quarters from the ceiling. So I got a problem here right off the bat. The crown's gonna come down right on top of these doors there's hardly an eighth of an inch here that I need to leave as a gap, and that means I've got to change the spring angle of the crown, otherwise the crown will come down too tight on the doors. And look what happens if I do change the spring angle. If I take this piece and I put it in here and rock it down so that it just clears the tops of the doors, I end up with a gap all the way across the top of it because it's at the wrong spring angle. The back of the crown back in here isn't sitting flat on the ceiling. The very back edge here is interfering with it hitting the ceiling. That's not that big of a deal. It's no big problem as long as I know it beforehand because I can take all of the crown that I'm going to install on these cabinets and I can hit the back of it with a power planer and just take that edge off. It doesn't matter how much I take off there because it's not going to show. Then, that piece will sit back in here and it'll be tight against the ceiling just as it's a hair off the tops of the door, so it'll look a lot better. And also, you notice I fastened backing up here too, right to the tops of the cabinets. I had to do that because I needed something to nail to. If you're installing crown in a kitchen that doesn't have a soffit like this and they're just the tops of the cabinets, then make this backing so that it fits the tops of the cabinets perfectly. And before putting it up there, run your crown all the way around it so the crown hangs down just a little bit. And then you just have to fasten the backing from the inside of the cabinets and your crown's on. It's a pretty slick way of going about it. And take a look at the slideshow that comes with this program. You'll see more about that. But this kitchen, it ends so easy. It has a soffit. We've already found that the soffit is too low right here. Let's find out what else is wrong before we cut any material. I always cut a couple of test pieces of crown whenever I find myself having a spring angle problem. I use the test pieces to check all the corners. I'm going to move the crown stop on my saw here and let this molding slide down so it ends up two and three quarters from the base of the saw. That means I'm measuring two and three quarters from the ceiling to the bottom of the crown molding here. I'll just make a mark right there on both ends of my fence. There we go. And I'll let the molding come down to there. And then I'll set my fence back up right so it's on those lines. Now I'll measure to see how far that is from the stop to the fence. That's got to be parallel. Yeah, two and three-eighths on that side. 
and almost two and three eighths on this side. It has to come back just a little bit. This has to be right on. There we go. The test pieces should be about a foot long, so they'll span just about any irregularity. I'll cut both pieces from this length here that I planed already, so it's planed to fit that new spring angle. I like to cut test pieces with an inside corner on one end and an outside corner on the other. Just like so. That way I can check both corners while I'm up on the ladder. You see, there's not a lot of wiggle room up here, is there? I've only got, like I said, an eighth of an inch between the top of the door and the bottom of the crown. The spring angle here has to be right on or I'm not going to be able to do this. If I cut the crown at the right spring angle, I won't have any problem at all. But let's find out if there's any other surprises so we'll know exactly what we're getting into before we start. This cabinet measures two and five eighths. And two and nine sixteenths down here. That's about a three sixteenths difference from the cabinet back there. Watch what happens when I put the crown up here. Ugh. So what am I gonna do? Rip the soffit out? I don't think so. Reset all the cabinets? Maybe but I'd kind of like to avoid that too. Besides, this situation isn't as bad as it seems. There's a pretty simple solution. Just adjust the spring angle on the crown as I move around the room. But before we get into that, let's look at the real problem that's going on here. Setting cabinets properly. By now, Everybody should have a laser. I turned off the lights so you'd be able to see this one a little better. Use a laser to find the high point of the floor before setting any cabinets. I'm gonna adjust this so it's shooting a line. Now you can see the horizontal line that's lit on the wall. All you have to do is set a laser up on a ladder like this. You don't need a fancy tripod or anything, just so it'll shoot a level line. And then measure from the floor to the line. It's 44 inches here. It's 43 and 3 eighths here. And right here, it's 43 and a quarter. The smallest measurement is the highest point of the floor. And if you haven't learned this lesson the hard way already, be warned. The high point of the floor isn't always right up against the wall. Measure to your laser line against the wall and measure two feet out from the wall too and the laser line will cast a line right on your tape measure. You might head off an unpleasant surprise and don't stop with the floor. If you're installing crown right on top of upper cabinet doors like we're doing here, then find a low point of the soffit too, or the ceiling, whichever you have, before you install any cabinets. You may find that the ceiling's so far out that you can't install crown molding without major surgery on the soffit. But wouldn't you rather know that before you get to the crown? I mean, before you get to any cabinets? Who knows? There might be a way to cheat the cabinets an eighth of an inch here and there as you're going around the kitchen. But let's get back to these cabinets. And I'll turn this light back on. Sometimes you can solve problems like this by changing the spring angle on the crown as you're working your way around the room. 
but changing the spring angle also means you're going to be changing the miter and bevel angles at every single corner. If you're cutting your crown on the flat, you'll have to determine the new spring angle with a protractor, then enter it into your Bosch Angle Finder or your Construction Master Pro for each angle. A crown chart won't help you because the spring angles are only for 38 degrees and 45 degrees. To learn more about that, see the slideshow with this set of DVDs. The nice thing about cutting crown in position is that you can change the spring angle easily, as we've already done for this corner, and you can keep changing it at every corner if you need to. Let's start right here with our cut list. We wanted the crown to end up two and three quarters from the ceiling on these three pieces around this cabinet. I'll write that down right at the top of this list, two and three quarters. And this first piece here measures 11 and three quarters, and it has a butt cut on the left and an outside corner on the right. 11 and three quarters, a butt on the left to an outside corner on the right. And the next piece measures 24 inches, and it has an outside corner on both ends. There, this piece measures 11 and 3 quarters, and it's got an outside corner on the left end and a butt cut on the right end. I'll write that down right here. A butt on the right and an outside corner on the left. Now this piece here, I'm going to cope this longer piece on both ends. I could take a different strategy, a different approach. I could cope both these end pieces, this piece here and this piece here that are on these two cabinets. And that would help lock this piece tight up against the wall. And since I'm going to have to twist this piece so that it matches the spring angle on the crown molding that goes on this cabinet, and the spring angle, the different spring angle, on the crown molding that's going to be on this cabinet, it might be nice to lock these, this piece up against the wall. It would help hold it there. But I wanted to demonstrate several different methods in this program. So instead, I'm going to cut this piece with double copes and install it last. You know, we're always getting ourselves into tight spots in this business. Sometimes it's because of the job, but sometimes it's because we just take the hard way without realizing it. Let's measure this piece. This piece measures 47 and 3 eighths. And we'll put a cope on both ends of that. 47 3 eighths. Great. On the left, it's going to have a cut at a spring angle that's 2 and 3 quarters from the ceiling, because I want this piece to match the crown that's running around this cabinet. But on the right here, it's going to be different. Remember, this cabinet was more like 2 and 9 sixteenths from the ceiling. So this side's going to have a different cut on it, so I'll write that down right here, 2 and 9 sixteenths. So one side's cut at one spring angle, and the other one's cut at the other spring angle. Like I said, I'm going to have to twist this piece a little. And for that, I'm going to probably plane some of the back of it off, too. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Now these three pieces I'm going to cut differently. I want them to be two and about nine sixteenths in the ceiling. This first piece measures about 11 and three quarters, just under. I'll write that down on my cut list. And that's a butt cut on the left. And on this corner here, it's an outside corner. And now this next piece, oh, and I want to make sure that all of these pieces are cut two and nine sixteenths. So I'm going to draw a line across here. And I'm going to draw a line across here to keep these pieces here separate from these pieces on this next cabinet. And this piece here is really a transition piece. So now let's get this next piece. And it measures 24 inches right across the face of the cabinet. So I'll write that down here. That's 24. And it has an outside corner on both ends. And I've got one more piece to get. Let me move the ladder. 
And that's this far end. And there's probably not enough room over here for all of us. But this one measures 11 and 3 quarters too. So let me write that down on a cut list. So it's 11 and 3 quarters. And on the right, it has a butt cut. And on the left, it's an outside corner. So now we've got all the, all the pieces we need are right on this cut list. So I can run over there to the saw and cut them. And I think I'm going to pre-assemble these too. I'll pre-assemble the section that goes on this cabinet by itself. And I'll pre-assemble the section that goes onto that cabinet separately. For this first list, I need to have the stop set up so the crown rises two and three quarters of an inch from the base of the saw. That means I have to measure up and make a mark at two and three quarters and set the stop up for that. And I've already done that because that's the way we, this is actually just the setup we had when we cut those test pieces. So I'm really ready to start cutting the three pieces at the front of this list. So I'll start with this first piece here. It gets a butt cut on the left hand end right here. So I'll just cut this off square. And that piece measures 11 and 3 quarters of an inch. I'll make a mark right there to an outside corner. So I'm going to swing my saw in this direction. The short point will be against the fence. There we go. That's the first piece. Now the second piece has an outside corner on both ends and it measures 24 inches. So I'll swing the saw and cut an outside corner on this end. And then I'll flush that up with the edge of my fence and hook my tape measure there too. And this measures 24 inches right to there. Great. And I'll carry that to the back of the molding and swing my saw. So I'm cutting another outside corner. Now that's the outside corner piece. And I've got one more piece to cut for that end, and it's an 11 and 3 quarter inch piece with an outside corner on the left. So I'll cut the left hand end first. And flush my tape there again, and pull that 11 and 3 quarter inch measurement right there. Let me make that mark a little bit better. Okay. And then this is a butt cut. So I cut this one off square. Now that's the three pieces we needed for the cabinet. Now let's cut the longer one that's going to run across the wall. Now let's look at this again. This piece has a two and three quarter inch spring angle on the left side. So we're going to cut that right now first while the stop is still set up at this spring angle. And then I'll have to switch the spring angle to cut this end. So we want to cut an inside corner right here. And now let's move the stop. So we'll take a new measurement here. We want to go 2 and 9 sixteenths. So I'll take my pencil and I'll get it right there on the 9 sixteenths mark and I'll just stab the fence there a little and make a little dot and I'll circle that so we know where it is. And I'll do the same thing down here. 2 and 9 sixteenths. I'll make a little dot there and then I'll circle that. And that way I'll know exactly where I'm setting my crown up. I'll put this crown in there. I have to loosen these, so I'll slide the stop back a little bit and let that crown drop down to those dots. So there we are here. And over here, 
the dots right there. And that means I can slide my stop right back up to the crown and snug it back down again. And the same on this end. So now I'm all set to cut the last end. So this piece now measures 47 and 3 eighths. I'll hook my tape measure on a long point and pull this measurement way down here to 47 and 3 eighths, right there. Good. Now, this is a strange cut, so I'm going to flip this over and transfer that line onto the back of the crown, too, just like so. And you'll see why that's a strange cut in just a second. Let me push these pieces out of the way. I'm going to swing my saw because this is an inside corner cut for a cope joint, just like the opposite end. But you can see why I made that mark on the back. It's really hard for me to see in here. So I'm going to make a couple of test cuts and get close. And now I'm going to look around behind here and take a look at that mark and see, yeah, I need to move it about another sixteenth of an inch, so I'll just wiggle it forward right now while I've got my hand on it. Great. Great, now this piece is ready to be coped. So I think I'll take this piece and these three and I'll put them over here out of the way so I won't get them confused. So now we're ready to cut these last three pieces down here. The first one has a butt cut on the left end. So we'll cut that first. And these are exactly like the first three pieces. It measures 11 and 3 quarters. to an outside corner. And the next piece measures 24 inches from an outside corner. On this end, I'm going to flush that up so I can hook my tape measure on there again and pull the 24 inch measurement down to here. There we go. To an outside corner on this end. And this time I'm going to have to hold the piece over here because it's just too short to hold it from this side. My hand would be too close to the saw blade. So I'll hold it over here and I'll really use the creep method here because I can't tell where the blade is really. So. We've got one more piece to cut. And it gets an outside corner on the left end. So I swing the saw. Flush it up again. Pull the 11 and 3 quarter inch measurement. And that is a butt cut. Alrighty, that finishes them all. Here's the first three pieces that we cut, plus the piece that gets the cope to cope inside corners. So I'm going to start the tool the same way I did before by getting the foot up against the bottom of the molding and then tipping the saw blade up, up against this bottom fillet and stopping the saw blade right there. And then while I'm in the push position, I'll take the saw and I'll start in on this bull nose here, but not too far because I'll get trapped in there. So I'll back the blade out. Now I'll switch around into the pull position. And while I'm in the pull position, I'll cut this little finger down here, tipping the saw blade up until it comes right up to the fillet.
and then I'll come up right up through this big bull nose here and cut all the way out through the top of it. Now I'll turn the saw around and I'll get rid of this waste right here. And clean up the finger. There we go. And I, you can see I wasn't perfect here. I nicked this just a little bit as we came up through this bull nose, but it doesn't matter. It's so close that that'll, that's, and it's such a sharp edge here that it'll just close right up and be a nice clean joint. Now this was the easy side. This is the left hand inside corner. I've got to cut the right hand inside corner now. So I'm going to take this piece and flip it around, put it back in my jig, and now we're going to cope the right hand in just like so. Let me move this out a little further. That should do. So this isn't that tough, but really you just need to practice this a few times to get used to it. Everything's just backwards. Watch this. I'm going to start in in the pull position instead of the push, and I'm going to cut right along the fillet here. And stop right there. And then, while I'm in the pull position, I think I'll get rid of this waste right here. So I'll cut that loose. And I'll come down here and I'll cut the finger in the pull position. Right, like so, and standing the blade up so I come right up against the fillet. And then I'll relieve that piece of waste and cut that so it drops out. And you can notice by standing the blade up, I can stop the cut right where I need to. And now I'll switch to the push position and I'll cut my way up through this bull nose. Yeah, you got to figure out how you want to hold the tool, which is most comfortable. You got to make sure you keep two hands on the tool, at least two hands touching the tool, and one hand on the molding, and then just cut your way right on up and be sure to tip the blade. Play with tipping the blade because the more you tip the blade, the easier it is to turn a corner and just stay right on your profile. There, that's it. A right hand cope, and that didn't take very long at all. Always use a layup table when pre-assembling crown, and don't be distracted by the miter. Get the miter close, then look at your measurement marks. If your marks aren't aligned with the bottom edges of the crown, your pre-assemblies won't fit. Before nailing the miter, be certain the crown is touching the corner strips on the layup table. On both edges, otherwise the pre-assembly won't be square. Once you're certain the measurement marks are aligned and the corner is square, fasten the miter with one inch brads or 23 gauge pens. These pieces go in pretty easily if you measure and cut them right. See, the crown just clears the doors. And I'm just tacking these in place for now. I'm using a little 23 gauge pin nailer. I'll finish fitting them all in once I get that center piece up there too. That fit pretty well. Let's, let's uh, see how this one fits now. This is the one I've got to twist really hard to get both these copes to line up. So I want to, uh, it's a lot easier to twist the piece if you plane the back edge of the crown a lot. So I want to try and get it pretty thin. So I'll come in with this plane again. I think I'll take a little bit of a bigger bite. 
it's good to cope these ends first before you start planing it. Otherwise, you might start coping the thing too short. You might start planing it too short. And I'm going to take quite a bit off of this. See how that works. I'm going to have to cock a little bit up in here because the soffit's kind of out of level in that direction too. You know, this is probably one of the more difficult spring adjustments you'll ever have to make. Changing the miter and bevel angles over a short run like this, in most kitchens, you can switch the crown over a much longer run because usually, you know, a bank of cabinets would run from that outside corner all the way to this outside corner. And that's a lot easier, especially if you're not changing the spring angle too much. It's usually best to tack the crown to the cabinet and the ceiling right in the middle of the run, then deal with the corners. As you twist each end, the center might move a little, but it usually comes back right where you want it when you twist the other end. And if you have two pre-assembled outside corners, it's even easier. Just be sure to let the glue dry on the outside corners before you start twisting the pieces. If you're twisting a long piece with two inside corners, a much better strategy might be to butt cut both ends, nail that up in the center, and then cope these two pieces to it, because that'll help you lock that piece up against the wall and it'll help twist the piece until everything's exactly in the right position. You know, whether you're installing base or crown molding, always come up with a good strategy before you start. You'll also find that controlling the spring angle and making small adjustments while cutting will help solve a lot of problems with crown molding. I'm sure you'll start coming up with a few creative solutions on your own, too. I hope you've gotten a lot out of this extended crown program. I wanted to include as much as possible about installing crown, but there were a lot of subjects I wasn't able to cover, like coffered ceilings. But I'm going to save that for a future program in the on-site educational home building series. Keep your eye on my website. There's going to be more. Windsor One's classical colonial crown has a 35 degree spring angle. If you're cutting this crown molding on the flat with a crown chart, you'll have to use the 38 degree spring angle column. That'll get you close enough for most jobs, though the top of the crown might not be skin tight to the ceiling. Sometimes you have to adjust the spring angle even more radically, especially on kitchen cabinets or around rooms where the heating registers are a little too high. If you're cutting in position, it's easy to alter the spring angle. Just slide the crown up or down on the miter saw fence. Remember, the fence is always the wall, so the bottom of the crown is against the fence. Just measure up from the base of the saw to determine how much the crown drops from the ceiling. But if you're cutting on the flat, you'll have to determine the spring angle in order to precisely dial in the miter and bevel angles. You can use a Construction Master Pro for finding the spring angle. First, find the projection, or run, and find the drop, or rise, of the crown molding. A framing square works well for that. Here you can see the crown rises up the wall 3 inches and runs out from the ceiling 2 inches. With a Construction Master Pro, enter 2 inches and push the run key. Then enter three inches and push the rise key. Next, press the pitch key. 
That figure is the complement of the spring angle. So subtract it from 90 degrees and you'll have the spring angle, 33.69 degrees, which is pretty close to 34 degrees. You can also use this Egyptian method. Tack two pieces of scrap wood together, place the crown snugly in the corner, then measure the spring angle off the back of the molding. If you want to change the spring angle, measure down from the top of the fixture, remember that's the ceiling, and draw a line on the wall of the fixture for the next custom crown position. Place the crown on that line and read the spring angle. For custom spring angles, you can use the latest Construction Master Pro or a Bosch angle finder to find the exact miter and bevel angles. For more on how to use those tools, check out the articles on my website. Cabinets without ceilings is pure fun. There's no ceiling to fight, and all the cabinet runs are usually pretty straight. I start by cutting a plywood form for each full run, then pre-assemble all the crown I can and mount it to the plywood form. It's easier to work at a table than on the top of a cabinet. A layup table is essential for pre-assembling crown. But before fastening the corners, be sure your pieces line up perfectly with each measurement mark. Otherwise, the piece might not fit on the form. Also, be sure the crown is tight against the layup table edges. And that means both edges. Otherwise, the corner won't be square. Only then should you look closely at the miter joint to be sure it's tight before nailing it. I like using a 23 gauge pin nailer on kitchen crown, especially if the molding is pre-finished. The pin nails are easy to hide with filler. I use pin nails to fasten the molding to the backing too. This is a pretty simple form for just one cabinet, but you can easily make a full form for half a kitchen with corners and pop outs too. Just pocket screw the form together and back up any splices with cleats. Pre-assembling the crown to the form makes it easy to install. Just screw the back to the cabinet, either from the inside of the cabinet or if there's room between the top of the cabinet and the ceiling, reach over and screw the backing down from the top. This bed mold is the bottom profile to the Windsor One Classical Colonial series. Mitering the inside corners with this thick of a molding would be a disaster. No matter where you lived, except maybe Southern California, seasonal wood movement would open the miters. I start the cut using the push position. This molding is really a crown profile without the back cut off, so I like to cope the left hand end, which puts the delicate sliver miter away from me. I always start at a slight back cut angle, tipping the blade to a bevel and keeping it at a steep angle as I enter the material. With the blade at an angle, it's easy to control the depth of cut and stop the cut exactly where you want. So don't just push the saw into the molding. Tip the motor up and down to advance the blade. With thick material, it's really important to make relief cuts. You won't always be able to finish a cut from one direction. With the saw still in the push position, I'm just beginning to cut into the OG on this profile. Next, I switch to the pull position, starting the blade into the molding at a steep angle, then lifting the motor as I approach the profile. I drop the motor, then lift it again, repeatedly angling the blade backward and forward. When I lift the motor, I cut right alongside the profile line. When I drop the motor, I apply a little bit of pressure on the side of the blade and sand right to the edge. Raising and lowering the motor angles the blade and helps turn the tool around a radius. This one's big enough to get all the way around from one direction. The area around any quirk must be cut delicately and precisely, especially for stain grade work. I approach the quirk from both directions, first cutting right to the profile, then angling the blade and back cutting everything out of the way. Small beads used to frustrate me. I'd bring out my rat tail files, my grinder, a sanding stick, a whole assortment of stuff. Now I just use the jigsaw blade. First I make a couple of relief cuts into the radius, cutting as far as the blade will fit. Then I cut straight toward the center, sometimes twice, getting right up to the edge of the bead. After that, it's like dental work, cleaning out the remaining waste. 
Don't try and cut with the blade. Instead, keep the blade at a pretty steep back cut angle and rub it back and forth near the edge like a file. You'll be shocked at the speed and precision of the cutting action. And even though the blade's an aggressive beast, you'll still have precise control as long as you keep two hands on the tool and one hand on the molding. Just nibble away until it's cut cleanly. I make the same relief cut in the butt end piece. And the joints usually close up pretty tightly without the need for additional touch up. Changing the spring angle of the horizontal molding also requires a custom scribe. Usually it takes me two or three tries to get the joint really tight. You can also miter this inside corner if that's your preference. Whichever method you choose, you'll have to cut a new wall angle on the back of the crown too to match the new spring angle. The reason carpenters change the spring angle of crown when they encounter rake ceilings on gable ends is because today's carpenters are mostly installers. Early craftsmen rarely changed the spring angle of crown molding. Instead, they carved custom sizes of molding for turning corners on raked walls and pediments. In this closer photograph, you can see the difference in size between the horizontal crown molding and the rake crown molding. Notice how you have to look very close to recognize the different sizes? That's because the spring angle proportions haven't been changed. Several common profiles of crown molding are available in different sizes, especially popular runs like S molding and S and Cove crown, which I'm using in this photograph. These joints also require careful scribing, but it isn't necessary to make a new wall cut on the back of the crown. With both fillets plumb at the ceiling and at the intersection of the S and the Cove, it's difficult to recognize the difference in molding sizes. If you're working on the exterior of a home, there are several ways to avoid this whole issue. Rather than making your returns or your fascia plumb, cut them square at 90 degrees to the angle of the rake. Yes, a plumb cut return also changes the fillet angle of the crown, so while it may not be perfectly in keeping with the classical orders, at least it's a clean way to terminate the moldings. The same avoidance alternative can be used on the interior of a home by installing a pendant. I make pendants from four pieces of crown, assembling them at my layup table with spring clamps and pin nails. I install a block of wood in the corner tall enough to provide full termination for the crown, and then I fasten the pendant to the block with glue and nails. When it comes to installing baseboard and crown molding, coping is definitely faster than mitering. Bill Shaw has produced a prodigious new machine that speeds up the coping process tremendously. This isn't an inexpensive add-on device. It's a full-blown, dedicated coping machine designed for pros who run a lot of molding. The trickiest part of the Cope Master is making the template. Once that's accomplished, the tool almost operates itself. Even a newbie carpenter can cope with this machine. The first step for crown molding is tilting the motor to the correct spring angle of the crown, for which there's a gauge at the bottom of the saw. The gauge must be set at exactly the correct spring angle, and I mean exactly. For this molding, I was able to flush the saw blade with the bottom fillet on the face of the crown, but that doesn't always work. That's because the bottom corner of the crown isn't always square like this profile. And don't think you can just dial in the gauge at the assumed spring angle of any crown. As you've seen with the Windsor 1 molding, crown is rarely made at exactly 38 or 45 degrees from the wall. Often it's 35 degrees or 34 degrees or 44 degrees from the wall. When working with the Cope Master, be sure to dial in the exact spring angle. But you don't need a protractor. Remember, the spring angle of the crown is always determined by the plumb cut on the bottom shoulder of the molding. To ensure that the blade is adjusted precisely, place a combination square flat against the blade shroud. Take a close look and check that the bottom shoulder of the crown is dead flat against the square. Once you've cut a precise template, record the angle of the Cope Master gauge on the template. No matter how you cope your crown, you always have to miter it first. 
See the slideshow on precise compound miters for more on this subject, because that miter must be correct or the cope won't work. When using the cope master, be sure your template stock isn't cupped or warped on the back. It must sit completely flat on the tubing. The cope master is equipped with two switches, one for the excellent light system and another for the motor. The saw also comes with magnifying glasses. Take my advice, use them. Start your first cut a safe distance from the profile and hog out most of the waste. Experiment with some scraps and molding and you'll quickly find that one direction is more comfortable to cut than the other. Find your most comfortable direction before starting the final cut. I usually hog out the waste from my left moving toward my right. I cut to the profile moving from my right toward my left. I've found there's two criteria to making a good template. You have to cut right to the edge of the profile and the cut has to be smooth or the stylus won't travel properly. After some practice, you'll be able to accomplish both and cut a good template in five to 10 minutes. Use your thumb behind a piece of sandpaper to smooth out the cut, but don't over sand or you'll change the curvature of the blade cut and the stylus won't travel correctly. If your molding isn't prime bright white like this material, then spray black paint on your template before cutting the miter. Black paint adds the most contrast so it's easier to see the profile you're cutting to. For this template, I left that sliver on the bottom of the crown. This is one instance where you really want to make that sliver thick and mortise the previous piece of molding. Once the template's sanded smooth, you can wax it so the stylus will glide better. Then mount the template in a template station vise. Be sure to push the template down flat against the tubing and don't over tighten the clamp. Use a gauge block to position the template. Next, adjust the stylus. Once again, because this molding was square on the bottom, I was able to adjust the stylus to the bottom fillet. There are two adjustment knobs for the stylus, a coarse black one at the back of the saw and this microfine adjustment knob near the front. Once you have the stylus set, try a test piece or two. Sometimes minor adjustments are necessary to get the cut right on the money. It's not always possible to align the stylus with the bottom edge of the molding, but you can adjust the stylus to any section of the molding that's perpendicular to the bottom plumb cut shoulder. Often there's an intermediate fillet that works well. If not, cut a single kerf into a scrap piece of 1x4. Lock the side carriage so the blade will travel only into the end grain of the 1x4. Then position the 1x4 in the template station and adjust the stylus so that it fits perfectly into the kerf. Use the same gauge block to position the workpiece in the cutting station so the front of both the workpiece and the template are perfectly parallel. Don't over tighten the clamp or the material might cup or rise off the tubing. The Cope Master works just like a key cutting machine. The stylus follows the template, which is why the template must be precise. Unlike a key machine, the Cope Master works best if you first hog out the waste. Then, as you trace the template with the stylus, the blade will reproduce the cut on the workpiece. For this photograph, I stood to the right of the cutting station and I took my left hand off the left knob so you could see the machine better, but it's best to stand right over the template station. By cutting the template flush with the back side of the station, you'll have a large amount of standing room, though it's not really necessary to have two hands on this tool. Like I said, the Cope Master almost copes by itself. And whether you use a coping foot, a coping saw, or a Cope Master, your miters have to be perfect or the joints won't be tight and flush. Here's a little trick that Bill Shaw recently taught me, and the third time he explained it, I really got it. At least, I think I did. First, when you position your crown at your miter saw, always be sure the bottom of the molding is flat and tight against the fence. That's the wall. Sometimes the top won't sit down flat against the base of the saw, but that's okay. The molding is often back cut a little so the top and bottom edges will touch the ceiling and the wall, even if the corner is out of square a few degrees. So don't be tempted to split the difference and rock the crown in the saw. That will change the spring angle. Remember, the spring angle is determined by the bottom plumb cut shoulder, which must sit flat against the fence. 
Before fastening down a crown stop, you can also check that your miters are the right length with a framing square. First, measure the projection or run of the crown. That's the distance from the wall, the fence, out to the front of the crown on the ceiling, the saw base. Now imagine that the crown is made from a solid piece of stock. Right, you'd never get it tight to the wall and the ceiling unless all the material on the back is cut out of the way. But if it were a single piece of stock, and you cut a perfect miter right through it, the miter would create an equilateral triangle on the base of the saw. One of those measurements must be the distance from your fence to the front edge of the crown, in this case three and a quarter inches. And even though most crown molding is back cut, you can still measure the second leg of the triangle with a framing square. Here the second leg of the triangle measures three and a half inches. That's too long. I must have dropped the crown on the fence just below my pencil line when I cut it. Here the measurement's three and an eighth inches, and that's too short. The miters won't be even, so the profiles will be mismatched by about an eighth of an inch. I must have raised the crown a little too much above my line. Here the second side of the triangle measures three and a quarter inches. Perfect. If all the miters measure three and a quarter inches, the copes will fit together like magic. Let's talk for a minute about how you approach a whole room. The key to most things, and carpentry is just like life, is having a good strategy. With crown molding, that means knowing where to start and where to end. When I install crown in a room, I prefer to move toward my right. That puts most of the copes on the left-hand end of the crown molding. That way I can cope at the heel of the miter. Coping the left-hand end of crown is a little easier because the long point of the miter is always away from me. But the real reason it's easier is because that's the way I first learned how to cope, with a hand coping saw. In a simple rectangular room, like a bedroom, it doesn't matter which corner you start at, any wall will do. I always cope the first piece and shim it away from the center of the wall, just tacking the ends in place, at least two feet from each corner. I adjust the piece later once all the crown is on the wall. If you cope the left-hand end of every piece, including the first piece, you can start with any piece in the room and shim it away from the wall just a little. Then it's easy to slide the last piece into place right behind the cope. Once you have the last piece in place, pull the shim and if your measurements were right, and even a little long, the joints will tighten right up. Here's another simple room, but with a small twist. The pop-out for the doorway requires a different strategy. I prefer to pre-assemble outside corners whenever possible, if the pieces are under seven feet long. Outside corners always look better if you pre-assemble them, and besides, it's faster and more fun. You don't have to fight with the irregularities in the walls and the ceilings while standing on a ladder. Pre-assembling the pieces around that door means they must be installed first or last, so the strategy for this room is simple. Either start with the pre-assembly or end with it. Some folks, I'm not going to say who, say they never cut a piece with two copes because it's just as wasteful as mitering inside corners where you often have to miter both ends of the molding. But I've found that double cope pieces for baseboard and crown molding, they really add to my arsenal of strategies. For this room, start by pre-assembling the splice for the long wall on the left. While that piece dries, Pre-assemble the crown for both corner pilasters. To make installation easier, I'd run butt joints into the walls flanking both pilasters. With the corners out of the way, install the crown on the back wall, cutting a cope-to-cope -cope piece. As you've seen in this program, with a coping foot, you can cope either end of the molding without much difficulty. If you're not accustomed to doing it, practice and you'll learn. You'll probably use that technique as often as I do. Next. Pre-assemble the three pieces that run around the bay pop-out. I can cope 135 inside corners, but it's faster and cleaner to pre-assemble them with miters. The next two pieces are pretty normal. The one on the left has a cope on the left end and a 67 and a half degree outside corner miter on the right. The piece on the right has a 67 and a half degree miter on the left and a butt cut on the right. The next piece across the bookshelf is also a standard left-hand cope with a butt cut on the right. 
I prefer to pre-assemble outside corners whenever possible, so I'd put together all three pieces running around the door opening, which means cutting a cope on the left-hand piece before pre-assembling the pieces. Here's another standard piece with a left-hand cope and a butt cut on the right. By now, the pre-assembled splice should be good and dry. Measure that piece tight, then cope both ends and snap it into place. There's no longer any excuse for not wearing safety glasses. Today, safety glasses are available in a variety of styles. They're scratch resistant, and some are even fog free. The yellow tinted goggles at the center top are fog free, and they're available from Dust Be Gone. They're great for 100% protection. See the list of suppliers under articles in this DVD for contact information. The wraparound glasses at the left and the right are available from most home centers. And you can find a distributor through FastCap, too. The glasses at the bottom are mine. They're prescription glasses made from high-impact polycarbonate, and they have protective side shields, too. I can't hear my daughter's telephone ring anymore, both because the pitch on her phone is the same as the tinnitus ringing in my ears and because I've lost hearing in both my ears from loud noise. If only I'd worn hearing protection when I started in this business. Without getting into decibels, I'll simply say that when it comes to hearing protection, something is better than nothing. Find the type of hearing protection that you're most comfortable with and wear it always. I like the earplugs with the neck cord on the bottom right. I always know where they are. The expanding foam plugs bottom left offer a little more protection, but I lose them too easily. And I've never been comfortable wearing either of the headsets at the top, though they're often the most effective. Use a dust collector. Dust collectors are important too, especially for table saws, chop saws, and routers. Even on the job site, a shop vac is better than nothing. In a shop, you can collect a lot more dust with a central system. Dust from a miter saw is the most difficult to control, and I'm still experimenting with this contraption. Always wear dust protection. Dust protection is like hearing protection, except instead of being measured in decibels, it's measured in microns. And with the type of material carpenters cut these days, and recent tests suggest that even wood sawdust is carcinogenic, you should always wear a dust mask or a respirator, in addition to providing plenty of ventilation. The respirator on the bottom left offers the most protection. The disposable masks at the bottom right and top left offer only fair protection, though they're more comfortable and readily available from home centers. The surgical type mask at the top right is available from Dust Be Gone, it's comfortable to wear and can be washed repeatedly. Miter saw safety. Never disable a saw guard. Saw guards are made for a purpose, believe me. I've seen the statistics. Too many serious accidents are caused by carpenters removing the guards. Don't remove the guard on your saw. There are safer, easier, and more accurate ways of lining up the blade with the measurement mark. Keep your hand behind the fence. I'm not a safety spokesman for the miter saw industry and I'm not repeating the instructions I've read that come with the tools. The reason I keep my hand at the back of the fence is so I can control the workpiece and creep the measurement mark slowly up to the blade. But the practice also saves my hand from a common miter saw injury. Remember, your hands and fingers are worth more than any piece of molding. Use clamps. Yes, I use clamps, too, whenever the need arises, and that's why I always keep them hanging from my miter saw stand, so I won't hesitate to reach for a clamp whenever I'm about to make a dangerous cut. Remember, if you hear that little voice in the back of your head whispering a warning, stop and listen to it. Wait for the saw to stop before reaching past the blade. I'm a production carpenter, and I break this rule far more than I should but I try not to. Most miter saws are equipped with electric brakes these days and it only takes a couple of seconds for the blade to stop. Sure, if your blade has a guard, what's the risk? Well, what if that guard hangs up just once?
This program is made possible by support from the following corporations who care about education in the construction industry. Windsor One, wood in its prime. Producers of the highest quality trim boards, moldings, and specialty wood products for architectural detailing. Bosch Power Tools and Accessories, supporting education, career development, and the future of the construction trades with a diverse line of corded and cordless products. Serious work, serious tools, Senko. Stabila. On-site productions, authoritative instruction in print, video, DVD, and personal presentations. Be sure to visit www.garymcats.com, a comprehensive community devoted to finished carpentry and architectural millwork.